Sandgate was a popular weekend and holiday destination. Thousands visited from Brisbane and further afield to escape the heat. Oh, it had to be the beaches, I think, the water. Shortcliffe was absolutely beautiful. On New Year's Day in 1934, 20,000 visitors came to enjoy this seaside resort. Well, before the 40s, there was no good road to take people to the north coast or the south coast. At that time, Sandgate was the main holiday destination. Because Sandgate was close to Brisbane, people came down all the weekends. We had a lot of uh, guest houses and houses for rent. Popularity began in 1866, when Governor George Bowen and other prestigious citizens came to Sandgate. Then, in 1882, when the railway came, this seaside town became more accessible and Sandgate grew as a seaside resort. Shunship was very, very popular before the war, I think. We had camel rides, donkey rides, billy goat cart races, big dogs pulling carts. Um, you couldn't get blanket space on Sandgate, Shortcliffe Beach or the creek because of the number of people that used to come off the trains from 6.30 onward. Sandgate was a popular picnic destination with charities and companies organising their annual picnics, many coming by train. They were huge events and they usually took place annually. And they had little races. And there was the RACQ picnic. They used to bring the children too. Cars were all decorated and they'd all go down to the waiting pool where the swimming pool is now. Sand garden competitions were another huge draw card, attracting crowds as large as 3,000 to 5,000 people. Sandgate's popularity waned when the Hornybrook Bridge to Redcliffe opened in 1935. Yeah, once the Hornybrook Highway was built, they were able to spread their wings and go to Redcliffe. Could be anything up to 20 buses going to Redcliffe and Scarborough and other places from the train. While Sandgate's heyday may have passed, it has remained a popular seaside destination. Sandgate was home to the moving pictures since 1910. The first silent pictures played at the first town hall in Kate Street, Shorncliffe, until it burnt down in the same year. They also played at the Sandgate Pier Open Air Theatre at what is now called Shorncliffe. Between the 1920s and 1950s, the pictures grew in popularity, hitting every Australian city. Almost every suburb had at least one picture theatre. It seems strange when you think about it that a small place like Sandgate having four theatres. The theatres were just about the main entertainment. There were a lot of lovely movies at that time. I went to the picture theatres every Saturday afternoon and favourite movies was um, at that stage was anything with Roy Rogers and the Phantom cartoons so you couldn't miss the cartoon so we went every Saturday. Bon Accord Theatre built in 1922 was the first purpose-built picture theatre in Sandgate. First screening silent movies accompanied by a piano and sometimes a four-piece band. The Jazz Singer, released in 1927, was the first talkie. The theatre stood on the corner of Rainbow Street and Hancock Street, Sandgate, where the service station now stands. It was a long, low building with an impressive facade and foyer. But in the theatre itself, it had a dirt floor and no ceiling linings. George Hancock owned the theatre. He closed it for major renovations in around 1932-33, and moved his operations temporarily to the Beach Theatre on Flinders Parade. When the Bon Accord reopened in 1935, it was more popular than ever. In 1960, the theatre closed permanently. Uh, the Bon Accord was much larger, a much larger and better theatre. Um, the Bon Accord, as I got older, I went there probably more often because I, we had a permanent booking. And you could do that in those days. The Bon Accord Theatre was in joint operations with the Strand. Instead of having to buy four sets of reels with the movies, they'd only get two. So they'd have about 
six or seven reels. Then they put them in metal cans and they're fairly heavy to pick up when you looked at them. So the boys would have to get on their bicycles and ride like mad in between the two picture theatres to, to exchange the reels of film. The Felix opened in Pier Avenue, Shorncliffe, also operated by George Hancock, owner of the Bon Accord. In the 1930s, it was closed for renovations and then renamed The Strand. It closed its doors in 1959. The building was moved to Northgate and became Mansell's Furniture Factory. The Strand was nicknamed a hen house. There might have been a few bird lice from the pigeons nesting in the rafters up on top. When it went to cinema scope, the screen was wider, so the curtains wouldn't go back far enough. So the owner of the theatre used to employ a schoolboy to climb up in the rafters to push the curtains back. But even funnier was, on a Saturday matinee, all the rest of his mates were in the audience with their Shanghais and try and ping him when he was up in the rafters moving the curtains. The Beach Theatre opened in 1924, making it the second picture theatre in Sandgate. It was on the corner of Flinders Parade and 3rd Avenue. It had a large gallery and a stage complete with curtains. The ceiling was timber lattice. The walls had large lattice windows for ventilation and heavy curtains for matinee sessions and when it rained. For several years, a large searchlight was mounted on the roof to attract cinema goers. George Hancock operated the theatre in the 30s when the Bon Accord underwent major repairs. But then the Beach Theatre closed. Around 1938, the artist Ian Fairweather lived there as caretaker. Then in 1948, the Hamer family, previous owners of the Mayfair, operated the theatre. Then the building was leased to the Police Citizens Youth Club. On the 13th of April 1978, it was completely destroyed by fire. We had a theatre down on the beach called the Beach Theatre, which uh, is finished up a skating ring and various other things. When we moved to Third Avenue, my mum's dog, George, and he'd sneak into the movies and sit in the aisle, and cross his paws and watch the movies. Mr True, he was the chap on the door, he was determined to get George out, so he turned all the lights up and he hunted George. And while Mr. True was going down, George was going up, sort of thing, and vice versa. So in the end, he had to give it away and turn everything off and start the movies. And George had come out and cross his paws and watch the movie. The Mayfair opened in 1934 on the corner of Brighton Road and 2nd Avenue and was the last theatre to open in the area. It was a small, cosy theatre with the best sound. The owner, Francis Hamer, excelled at giving his patrons the best cinematic experience, installing a high-quality photophone audio system. It was a popular theatre and was greatly missed when it ceased operations in 1947. It then became Palakos Shirt Factory in 1948, then Bayards from around 1962 to 1982. The Mayfair was in the most the shops. A whole group of us used to all go, either Saturday afternoons. Uh, that was probably the poshest theatre we had in Sandgate. The building was demolished in 1985, removing the final evidence of a thriving, movie-going pastime in the Sandgate area. The growing popularity of television saw the demise of picture theatres throughout Australia. They went into decline then because we, we had a burned or we had a drive-in theatre and people used to flock to that then, fill the boot up with people and then let them out once they got inside. Fellow Australians, it is my melancholy duty to inform you officially that in consequence of a persistence by Germany in her invasion of Poland, Great Britain has declared war upon her and that as a result, Australia is also at war. Well, I can remember the, the night that uh, war was declared. I was 10 
haven't sort of got any bad memories of World War II. Actually, they were sort of all good memories, really. A Royal Australian Air Force training base was built on the reclaimed land just south of Decker Park in Brighton. It opened around July 1941. It was primarily a training base for the RAF and the WAF. Many thousands of Australian Air Force personnel went through its training base. It was an Air Force base during the war, because that's where my brother left from. He was a Lancaster bomber pilot, and he was killed in the last raid. The Australian soldiers used to practice through the bush, and they'd come into the shop and buy things because they only had bully beef and dog biscuits, as they called them, for rations. On the 18th of April 1942, at 5.45 in the afternoon, a large Flying Fortress bomber force landed between the base and the Honeybrook Bridge. Bringing much excitement to the tranquil lives in Sandgate during the war years, many locals gathered to watch the bomber take off a few days later at 4 o'clock on the 21st of April. We, we didn't think he was going to get, get enough height out of the flight, but he got up to about halfway across the Hornybrook Highway and dipped his right wing and he went around and never stopped climbing and we never saw him again. Sadly, on the 15th of July 1942, two pilots plunged to their death a mere half mile from each other. The first was on that fateful morning. Uh, even tide again. Early morning I was fishing on the Sandgate Pier, playing hooky from school. Uh, Air Cobra came around and he looked as though he was practicing staffing and he was coming around on, the, on one wing. And I said to myself as a lad, I said, he comes around once more, his tips, wing's going to hit, hit one of the waves and he's going to turn turtle. And sure enough, he went around and waffled. He rolled over and over. Then, in the afternoon, a pilot on a practice alert run. We heard this whining noise. We saw him drop out of the clouds and, and uh, suicided right into the area beside where his mate was. We found an old wing off the first plane and we cut it up and took it home and I had a piece of it nailed on my wall, bedroom wall, for I don't know how long as a kid. The last parade was held at the RAF base in 1946. Following its closure, the base was purchased by the Queensland Government and converted into Eventide Nursing Home. Christmas, the first Americans came here after Pearl Harbour. Used to come to Sandgate to have a look at the beach and the sea and... Dad met four walking up Brunswick Street in his lunch hour and he invited them for Christmas lunch. Always had plenty of chewing gums in their pocket to give the kids or, or coins. Um, four other little favours that they wanted to meet, you meet your sister or your brother. Oh, they were good to us kids. They brought us lollies and we thought they were wonderful. <laughs> During the war years, changes for many Sandgate residents included building bomb shelters and slit trenches, as well as the weekly air raid practice. Well, the slit trench was a, a zigzag trench. In case we had a, an air raid. Pupils dug their own slit trenches. At the convent, we'd all have to file down there and crouch down in the trenches with the hands behind our head. And I think we must have put the pegs in our mouth to stop biting our tongue. We had air raid practice every Monday, I think it was, the sirens would go off. Uh, and you could hear it all over Shawcliffe. But there was one genuine siren. One of the teachers, she burst out crying because she was afraid of all the children. I can remember the nuns walking up and down praying. If, if the Brahmas had come over, well, they sure would have found us very quickly. <laughs> but it was a false alarm after all said and done. <laughs> the Japanese weren't coming. Rationing began in 1942 to ensure the fair distribution of food and clothing. It was managed through coupons. We swapped coupons for um, 
um, butter from grandma and grandma took our tea coupons and things like that. So. Clothing, there's plenty of clothing coupons because you know, the, uh, the hand-me-downs and that sort of thing that went on. I was tall so we got, a, the tall people got a few extra coupons. I used to go up and buy tobacco with a ration ticket for my father. Hello citizens, the war is over. The Japanese government has accepted the terms of surrender imposed by the Allied nations and hostilities will now cease. In the 1860s, Sandgate was a quiet place where the well-to-do would come to take the waters. A group of visionaries believed Sandgate would be an ideal port town. They formed the Sandgate Pier Company in 1865. They petitioned for a provisioning pier for passengers and cargo, as well as being a leisure pier. Sandgate never became a port town and a provisioning pier never eventuated. However, by 1884, an iconic pleasure pier had been built. First, the Sandgate Pier was only 260 metres, but ferries couldn't dock at low tide, so it was extended to 351.5 metres. The pier included separate gents' and ladies' baths. In the 1930s, a shark-proof enclosure was built between the pier and the stone wall. We used to go down there to the jetty, as they call it, because the Penny Arcade was up there, the pier was up there, and there was lots of places to play. And you could spend the whole day there. If you wanted to go on the pier, it cost you a penny. We'd go walking or fishing out on the pier. You used to swim in the enclosure. Men one side and women the other. Typical of seaside resorts of the time, there were tea rooms, kiosks, and a penny arcade at the entrance to the pier. There's a room on one side to have afternoon tea and on the other side of the pier there was a little place if you wanted to buy an ice cream. You can still taste that ice cream. We had a big cupboard in penny arcade at the commencement of the pier. We lined it with machines. If you put a penny in you could see movies or you could play games, and, and people flocked to them. Where they had punching bag, electric shocks, uh, grabs, cricket games. I can remember going to the Penny Arcade, but I was so little then, and can't remember much more than putting the penny in and having things fly around. The Brisbane to Gladstone Yacht Race, which started at Woody Point Jetty in 1949, moved to the Sandgate Pier in 1955. It has been there ever since. And I would have gone up there to watch the start of the Brisbane to Gladstone yacht race. It used to be televised in the early days, so you could watch it at home when television came in. The pier was closed in 2012 due to damage caused by marine borers. In 2016, the much-anticipated new pier opened, replicating the architect F.D.G. Stanley's original design. The Sandgate Pier, or Shorncliffe Pier as it is now known, continues to be an icon and a nostalgic connection to our past and beyond to a time when the original people lived here. Before the concept of holiday resorts and pleasure piers touched these shores, the Turrbal people called their coastal land Warra, an open sheet of water. My name is Murray Downs and I was born, uh, I'm 89 years of age now, I'll be 90 in a month's time. I was born in uh, um, 1929. My name's Ivy Hillstan, Nee McEwen. I was born in uh, 1932 and I'm 86. My name is Bert James Mitchley, I'm 90 years of age gone. <laughs> My name is Jim McAlpine. I was born in 1933. I'm 86. My name is Thelma Webb. Well, I'm 90. And I was born in 1929. My name's Mary Young. I was born on the 31st of January 1929, which makes me 92. Lynn 
Linda Beryl Clem, 105, 1914. Heather Glazier, I am 99 and I was born on the 25th of April, 1920. Yvonne Darcy, and I was born on the 8th of October 1931. Margaret Jase, I was born in 1936, 83. I'm Pam Burney, and I'm the president of the Sangate Historical Museum. <laughs>